Um, thank you uh, all for coming. I'm Yair uh, Wallach. I'm the uh, lecturer in Israeli studies and the head of the SOS Center for Jewish Studies. Um, I'd like to th start by thanking uh, SOS for supporting this lecture and, uh, and also the LMEI, the London Middle East Institute, who are co-hosting uh, this lecture with us, as well as uh, the School of Languages, Cultures and Linguistics, um, who has also um, contributed to um, uh, making this happen. Uh, now, the topic of Jews of the Arab world is one of the core issues for us at the SOA Center for Jewish Studies. Um, it's only natural, because we specialize in Asia and Africa as an institution, it's only natural that for us this is the prime uh, focus. And it gets, it's an issue that gets relatively uh, little attention, in, um, I think, uh, generally. Uh, so we are. Uh, it's important for us, and we've done uh, many events in the last few years around, uh, around this topic. Now, the discussion of Jews in the Arab world is very much shaped by the dichotomy, uh, the perceived dichotomy between Jews and Arabs. Jews and Arabs today are seen as antonyms, as opposites, as something that categories that exclude each other as rivals, enemy, enemies even. And this is, uh, this idea of the dichotomy of Arab and Jew is very much, of course, the product of the 20th century and specifically the, um, uh, the Palestine-Israel conflict. And when there is discussion of Jews and the Arab world, that discussion is very much dominated by the conflict and, and conducted under the shadow of, of the conflict. Uh, so on the one hand, we have Israeli um, um, argument that try to equate the, the exodus of Jews from the Arab world with Palestinian refugees, and there's objections to that uh, uh, equation. There's also the, a debate on the relation between Zionism in these communities. Were they saved by Zionism or are they, should be, they be seen as victims uh, of Zionism, as Ella Shohat uh, famously argued? Now, these are important questions, both intellectually and politically. But in a way, what they uh, force us, what they make us, is to look into this whole question through the eye of the needle of, uh, uh, of Israel-Palestine. While we're talking about communities, if we talk about Jewish communities in the Arab world that uh, existed in the area, in the region, for centuries, if not millennia, and played a crucial part in respective societies and countries and cultures. Um, and, and so the result is a somewhat reductive uh, discussion. So one of the interesting uh, developments of the last 10, 15 years, and this is the topic of the lecture tonight, is a reemergence of interest in, in Arab Jews in the particular context uh, in which these communities existed. And the interesting thing is that that interest and that fascination comes from the region itself, where there is a re-examination of Jewish heritage uh, and contribution and, and role in these respective societies. Um, and I think we have uh, no better scholar to to talk about this, then uh, Dr. Najat Abdel Haq, who is one of the emerging uh, scholarly uh, voices uh, on the history of the Arab Jews. Um, Dr. Abdel Haq is a Berlin based Palestinian scholar, originally from Nablus. Um, she studied at the universities of Bezeit in Palestine and Leipzig in, in Germany. She received her PhD uh, in Middle East studies uh, at the University of Erlangen Nuremberg in Germany in 2012. And the product of that was uh, her book, 
Jewish and Greek communities in Egypt, Entrepreneurship and Business Before NASA, which was published by IB Taurus in 2016 and is available for sale outside uh, the door in a significant discount. So grab your copy. Um, this book is the first academic study of the economic role of Egyptian minorities, and it's based on original and, and groundbreaking uh, research of archival sources. And it's, in that sense, it's, it's a very significant um, study. Um, and Dr. Abdel Haq teaches at the University of Erlangen, but she's also consultant on Middle East in different media outlets. And if you watch, uh, for example, Deutsche Welle in Arabic, you are very likely to see her. Um, so uh, I'd like uh, to welcome her uh, for this talk on re rethinking and reclaiming history, emerging Arab interest in Jewish heritage in the Middle East. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to uh, first to thank uh, the London Middle East Institute, the SOAS Center for Jewish Studies, uh, Dr. Eil Varach, and Professor Gilbert Ashkar for making um, uh, this lecture possible for their invitation, and to all other people who worked in the in the background to make this uh, possible today, the whole organization and the contacts with the publisher and so on. And um, I would like to thank you all for coming this evening. Um, the late Samir Naqash, who's an Iraqi Jew, uh, who was forced to migrate from Baghdad, said, I was a Jew in Iraq, and now I'm an Iraqi in Israel. Uh, this sentence of Samir Naqash brings us back to the question of how did Iraqi, Syrian, Egyptian, Yemenite, Moroccan, Tunisian Jews perceive themselves and how do they today or how the second generation does today. But besides the, the Jews themselves who most of them were forced or some of them maybe willingly left their countries, there are also um, the residents of these countries who now are also interested about this heritage. Today, I would like to present and discuss with you a phenomena that emerged, we can say last decade or maybe a bit earlier, where the question of the Arab Jew um, and the history of departure and expulsion uh, became much more popular than it was before. Um, in fact, Maybe 10 years ago, this wasn't a topic to be discussed in any Arab country. On the contrary, it was only seen, I would say, uh, from a security perspective, especially in this, in this country. If anyone tried to do some research, which I also myself experienced when I was in Cairo, to do some research on the Jewish minority, the first thing you will face is a direct or indirect meeting with the, with the security of these countries because it's considered as um, a national issue related to Israel. And so um, it's really difficult to, to escape this, this space or this room. Uh, about 800,000 Jews used to live in the region between Morocco and Iraq. Uh, and the majority of them left these countries between 1948 and 1967. Okay, there are some cases that left later, maybe the Syrian Jews were the, the last to leave in the early 90s. Uh, here I have one of my favorite images, which is um, the school of the Karate, Karait community in Cairo. And uh, I use it very often because it's one of the images that show us if we, if we see uh, the image and the people sitting, and we don't, we're not fluent in Arabic, you will not necessarily know that they are Jews or Muslims because the rabbi in the middle with the, with the white uh, cover uh, can be also uh, a sheikh or an imam or a teacher uh, of Quranic school. So the change started to find place 
to find the interest in Arab Jews. I know that the term Arab Jew can be discussed and maybe also we can have a fight about it. Can Jews be Arab? Can Arab be Jews? And so on. Um, but still, I will use it here because I, I see the cultural connection between all residents in the Arab countries um, with, with the places and with, the, with, the, with their culture. So uh, Arab here might not be a political term or an ethnic term as such, but let's say a cultural term because the Arabic and partially also the Islamic culture influenced all minorities who were living in this, uh, in this region. Um, so the first who really started uh, this interest uh, was in Morocco. But Morocco has a special case because, in fact, the Moroccan community or the Moroccan Jews did not leave totally the country. And today, there are about 2,000 Jews living in Morocco. Uh, compared to other countries, it's a huge number. If we take Cairo, they are maybe 14. Or if we take Egypt, uh, I don't know how many are in Iraq, and apparently in Syria there are no any more in, or in Beirut. Uh, of course, Tunisia is also a special case because of Jerba. So um, the Jewish Museum, the Moroccan Jewish Museum was opened in 1997. Uh, the initiative was from a Moroccan Jew who passed away. Uh, and then it was closed and then reopened in 2013. But beyond this very singular example, and the filmmakers were the avant-garde of this revival. And uh, in this context, I would like uh, to mention mainly uh, Forget Baghdad by the Iraqi filmmaker Samir, who in fact went back uh, to Israel and to New York to meet the friends of uh, his father. And followed by uh, the film uh, Salat Baladi. It's an Egyptian film. It's the story of an Egyptian family by Nadia Kamel. Forget Baghdad was uh, 2004, uh, Salat Baladi was 2007, and now today we have about 12 films. One of them is El Gusto, it's about the Algerian Jews and music, and the last two films, at least the one I know about, um, is one by Rula Khayyat, she's a Lebanese filmmaker, and she did the film From Brooklyn to Beirut. It was released by the end of 2016, and, um, Yasmina Benari did the film um, on Albert Arieh. He's, in fact, uh, the last Jew living in Cairo. And it's uh, called Atiti's Balcony. And the film discusses not only his Jewishness, maybe his less Jew, less Jew but also his, his political career uh, in Egypt. So um, from my perspective, uh, despite of the fact that I'm specialized in Egypt and I know much more about the situation in Egypt and about the data in Egypt, but this phenomena is really spread through all the countries. Um, and uh, one of the main factors that show this emerge of interest is in fact literature. So literature we had, um, or we have until now since two, 2006, about 25 novels and fiction where the Arab Jew, going into details, the Iraqi Jew, the Egyptian Jew, the Algerian Jew, uh, are the main figure and the, and the plot of the, of the fiction. This wasn't the case before, despite of the fact that we had, in the novel of uh, Wujih Ghali, who's Egyptian, and he wrote in English in 1964, there was a main Jewish figure in his novel, and then Ihsan Abdul Quddus and Najib Mahfouz and Ibrahim Abdel Majid, which are famous Egyptian authors, had similar, but the novels were not about the Egyptian Jew in that sense, but Jew, Jews, had, had, Jews were figures in these novels. What is new now is that there are, in fact, uh, there is a new generation writing novels, writing fiction, and discussing the history uh, of um, the Jews of, of Arab countries. Uh, one of the first book was from Brahim al-Jibin, he's Syrian, and it's a diary of uh, a Jew of Damascus. It was published in 2006, but it was forbidden in Syria. So you could not get the book at any bookstore in Syria. You could get it in Beirut, but also not, not easily, and the, 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 the number of, uh, of copies uh, is, uh, is very limited. And uh, the book about uh, the Jews of Bahrain by Ali Jallawi. Uh, both books did not find 
like, how to say, did not become really famous, but these are one of the first who were, uh, that were published in, in Arabic. Uh, more famous are other books. Um, I tried to be a little bit artistic, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the book of Ali Badr, who's, in, who's an Iraqi author, uh, Harz al Tab or The Tobacco Keeper, uh, and Ayam Shatat Fawl Kamal Rahayim, he's Egyptian, uh, Yahud al Iskandariya is also an Egyptian work, and Sifr al Tarhal, also, we see that the number of Egyptian authors is high, are, are part of the books who became famous. Uh, Ali Badr's work and the work of the Yemenite author Ali al Maqri reach the, the long list of the Booker's uh, Prize, of the Arabic Booker's Prize, in 2009-2011. So, um, and Ali Badr's work was translated into English into 2012. Ali al-Makri's work, as far as I know, was translated into Hebrew, but not I know that it was um, translated into English. Besides these novels that I'm really, I won't mention them all here, uh, there is a vivid translation activity uh, of biographies of Jews who used to live in Arab countries, again, Cairo is very famous, that were written in English or in French and translated into Arabic. So this work of uh, Lucite Lignado, the man with the white shark skin suit, I think it's now in the fourth edition uh, in, in Cairo, and it, it, it was for a while kind of a bestseller, and uh, others followed, but um, not as famous as this book. And there is, beside literature and beside films, uh, there's a blog by Na'al al-Tukhi. Na'al al-Tukhi is an Egyptian journalist, author, and translator. And he, ha he has a blog, uh, Thus Spoke Kohen, Haikada Tahaddatha Kohen, or Kah Medaber Kohen, where he really um, specialized in translating uh, Hebrew literature into Arabic, but he was very much interested in the uh, so-called Eastern Jews or Mizrahi Jews. The most famous is the work of al Behar. And uh, Atuhi translated it into, into Arabic, and it was published in Cairo in 2016, and also was, now it's in second edition, by al Kutub Khanna. So we have literature, and we have um, a blog, and in Morocco we have, uh, sorry, in Iraq we have another activity, it's, it's, not, it's not fictions, but Mazen Latif is a journalist, and he published, um, Sorry, he published uh, an, a huge number of books, maybe about 10, about different uh, Jewish figures. One of them is from Dr. Sam Beda, who's among us today, <laughs> about um, the, the Iraqi kitchen. Uh, and he translated other works. And Mazen Latif's uh, situation is very specific because he has a, a, a column every second week in, in an Iraqi newspaper called Al Alam. I have a screenshot downstairs, sorry, on the down um, uh, of the picture where, where, he, where he writes uh, about one Jewish, famous Jewish figure. Here he writes about Jackie Aboud and he has an article about Samir Naqash and about Naim Qattan and uh, Shaul, uh, um, Anwar Shaul, thank you. <laughs> And, and many others. Um, in Morocco, there is a very vivid um, scene of novels and translations, but it goes also uh, farther because since 2003, there is uh, a festival in Sawira. Uh, it's uh, the Andalusian or the uh, Atlantic Andalusian Music Festival. This festival is not Jewish by definition or as to say, but it's one of the unique festivals in all the Arab countries that revised the Andalusian Jewish music that was a very important tradition in Morocco. And uh, the festival, uh, as we see here, it's, the poster is from 2013. It was its 10th anniversary. This year it's gonna be its 15th anniversary and it's becoming a, a much more popular and famous festival and uh, some famous singers, um, I mean, became known there, or some singers who were not famous, you know, is an orchestra uh, that uh, also of uh, Jewish musicians, Jewish Moroccan musicians, who to take part in this. So we have, um, um, 
We have this on, let's say, on intellectual level. But another action, um, which is, I think, from my perspective, again, being uh, expert of Egypt, since summer 2017, uh, Madame Magda Harun, who's the head of the Egyptian Jewish community, and others who, some of them are uh, the sons of uh, Jews who uh, converted to Islam mainly, and others who are not related at all with the Jewish community, started an organization called, uh, called uh, Jamayat Qatr al uh, which is um, the Drop of Milk Association in Cairo. And what they do is, as we see here, they are reopening the synagogues, the libraries, cleaning them, and making them um, accessible to public, which is really uh, something special and unique because this wasn't, it wasn't possible to enter any library, for example, when I was doing my research back in 2007, 2008, 2009. It was easier to enter the Egyptian archives than entering the, any, any Jewish library or archives. I collected some pictures from their work. All the people who work there uh, do voluntary work. And this is, um, the synagogue in uh, Heliopolis, where I'm trying to, to repair, you know, the lights. Finishing the chairs. And reopening, it, it was officially reopened the Rambam Synagogue, or uh, Maimonides, Ma'abad ibn Maimun. Uh, it's in the Jewish quarter in Cairo, in Old Cairo. Uh, it was opened, um, 2010 for a very short period and closed again, and now they reopened it and it's, um, it's public also for tourists to visit, which wasn't the case before. Um, and they are having other, other uh, activities. I think I, by now three synagogues are cleaned at least, not all of, the, all, all of them are renovated because they were closed for like 50 years. And there's a debate in Egypt, also with the Egyptian community uh, outside Egypt. The Brooklyn Egyptian Jewish community protested uh, through a letter to the Egyptian embassy in the US asking to stop these activities because uh, they want synagogues only to be a place for worship. But the idea of uh, Magda Harun and uh, the activists with her is uh, to, to make these spaces for cultural events to bring people back into the synagogue and to get more information about uh, the Jewish heritage. So what is interesting from my perspective, taking the novels or taking all these uh, activities is that not all of them is done, especially the novels. These are not novels written by uh, Arab Jews, let's say, or by their children or grandchildren. I mean, taking, um, or uh, excluding the, the translated books that were written in the States or in France, but it's by younger Egyptians, mainly. I mean, the 25 novels I have mentioned, novels I have mentioned, 20 of the authors are young people, uh, not really famous names, but young people. Ma'taz Zifteh, when he wrote his, uh, the first edition of his book, uh, The Last Jews of Alexandria, he was 27. So we have uh, a young generation uh, that is uh, emerging to write about this. And these people did not live Egypt or Alexandria or Cairo or Morocco or Tunisia, Syria or Iraq as a, as a multicultural, multi-ethnic societies. The, this is a generation that, that grew up uh, where um, in Egypt, uh, okay, they, they, they are Copts, but, but they are Egyptian Copts, but, but no other minorities that was before. And the same is uh, for Iraq or even for uh, Tunisia. And uh, the other thing which really is interesting here that all these novels, despite of the difference in details, and to be frank, not all of them are really good novels in literary sense, but this is not the question here, um, have a common, common aspect. And they go beyond stereotyping. This is the first thing. And the other thing, they go beyond the Israel-Palestine conflict. And this is one of the, uh, the things that really attracted my attention. And I asked myself first the question, and then I started to find answers, is young filmmakers, young authors, uh, musicians, or the activists in Cairo, why are they interested in a community that disappeared? 
and in a community that, in fact, is only new, known through, through the conflict and always related um, to Palestine. And why is this uh, emerging now and um, why it didn't happen before? I would like to show you some images just, just to put the context. The man on the right side is uh, General Mohammed Najib, who was the first Egyptian president after the revolution or coup in 1952. And on the left side is uh, Rabbi Nahum Afandi, the great rabbi of Egypt. And this is an image of a visit of Mohammed Najib on Yom Kippur in uh, October uh, 1952 to the synagogue in Shara Adli, which is one of the biggest synagogues in Cairo. So the, what, what, what is in our mind is that, especially regarding Egypt, that Abdel Nasser's era or the coming of Abdel Nasser was the main reason why the Jews left. We can elaborate on this later, if you like, also. Um, shows us that at least in the beginnings, there was no hostility in the sense of classical hostility against the Jews, per se. They were Egyptians also at the same time. You know, they, were, they are not and were not at that time uh, citizens of the state of Israel. So this is the uh, General Mohammed Najib. And this is, for example, one of the books of uh, uh, Jewish law and family issues. And this is an example um, how these books were printed, in fact, in Hebrew and in Arabic um, to be accessible to the people. Also, again, showing that the Jewish community, the Egyptian Jewish community, and then also the Iraqi Jewish community, the Syrian, were um, influent in Arabic as all other citizens um, in, uh, in those countries. And this is um, an image most probably from Alexandria, from the Eliyahu Hanigbi synagogue, uh, one of the Shabbat prayers. So to go back to, go back to, the, to the main question, um, the whole history of, of the Arab Jews were in fact captured in the Palestine-Israel conflict. And for sure, to be also very clear here, it's, um, it's not possible to deattach it from the conflict and to deattach the discussion from the conflict. But the question is, where were the spaces one can discuss this question or this history beyond the conflict? And in fact, it wasn't really possible. Um, I consider that the history of centuries of, of vivid communities, as I said, 800,000 to up to 1 million, between Morocco and Iraq, uh, was frozen or captured uh, starting 1942. There is a very famous speech of David Ben Gurion, where he mentioned, as to say, the Mizrahi Jew, the Oriental Jews, that had to be brought to Israel as a Hebrew work working force, Avoda um, Avrit, to the country. So this was like. The, the starting point of the political interest of the Zionist movement in the, in the Jews of the, of the Arab countries, of the Orient. And it was a 42 until 67. If we try to discuss this history, these are the dates we are stuck in. When uh, was there a political interest? Before, there was an interest, but not really an active one, to see what communities are these, uh, how Jewish they are, and so on. I mean, we are talking also here also about uh, Ashkenazi uh, hegemonical discourse in these regards. And then 67, the 67 war. It is um, like, there is like a kind of a block, as if it's an ice block. And all the history or the contribution of this community was kind of forgotten or ignored, let's say. And these are the years where the whole issue um, is discussed. I would like to, to elaborate a little bit on this, to put it all in context. Um, mainly two discourses emerged after 48, and in fact not really after 48, but much later. One of them was more dominant, which is, as I call it uh, through my research, and if you like, the first chapter of my book elaborates on all this, on all the writings, and all the articles, and all the arguments. 
uh, which is a nationalistic discourse. And the other one is, uh, is not a nationalistic discourse. It tries to, dis to discuss uh, the whole question beyond nationalism. But since the nationalistic discourse was the dominant one and became by time the official narrative or the official discourse, I will go, I will really just elaborate on that uh, a little bit. So um, this nationalistic discourse, again, can be divided into two parts or can be seen from two perspectives. There is an Arab nationalistic discourse and Israeli nationalistic discourse. Well, the Arab Egypt nationalistic discourse was also very much dominated by the Egyptian, by the Egyptian discourse, of course, because of the importance of the country, because of the events that happened in the country, and because of the relation to Israel. Um, but it came mainly started after 67. I mean with that, that before 1967, the, uh, the works or the books that were written about Egyptian Jews were not necessarily um, hostile toward this community. After 67, it's also, we can understand after the wars and after the, uh, the October war in 73, um, it emerged more. But uh, the visit of uh, Sadat to Jerusalem and his speech in the Knesset uh, made, a, let's say, an ex explosion of uh, academic and non-academic discussions. And the discourse was really, the late 70s was when the moment where the discourse was very, very strong and became um, very, very much dominant. So this discourse, I mean, when, when checking all the, the literature and the writings that were written, says that, um, in a nutshell, the Jews of Egypt in, enjoyed a good life with equal rights. They misused this, these circumstances, and we can, we can, I mean, it's now the Egyptian case, but similar, similar slogans were uh, heard from, from other countries, from other Arab countries. Um, and the moment they could, they turned their back to the country, and, so they are not part of us. And Egyptian Jews were not, or are not a natural or an organic component of the Egyptian or of the Arab society, and the majority of them symp sympathized with Zionism, even if not publicly, but, you know, silently, and that's why um, it's legitimate to, to exclude them of, of our societies. As I mentioned, this perception of Jews was not um, established by 48. I would like to give an example. In 1952, in January 1952, in fact, on the 26th of January 1952, there was a, a huge fire in Cairo, okay? Uh, especially in the so-called West al-Balad, which we call today downtown Cairo, uh, or Qahir uh, al-Ismailiya. Um, among the, the stores that were burned at that time were department stores uh, of Shikorel, who was a very famous Egyptian Jew with very famous department stores. And, for example, the store of the father of uh, Monsieur Albert, Albert Arier, this Jewish person who still lives in Cairo. And all these stores and all others were compensated by the Egyptian government and was considered as national economy. So, uh, Shikorel was compensated for the burn that happened, as did Sidnawi, who was a Syrian uh, merchant with a huge department store, as did, for example, the father of uh, Albert Arie, his name was Ibrahim or Abraham Arie. So we see that in 52, in e e Egypt was in an uneasy situation at that time, a political situation at that time. These people were considered uh, totally as Egyptian, as Egyptian citizens, and they had the right to get compensation. The, the change, the big change came after 67, and let's say after more blood was shed between Israel and Egypt. And later in the 70s, when, when, we, when we see the whole uh, writings, uh, mainly of Anas Mustafa Kamel and Siham Nassar, uh, there are also others, um, the, the Jewish citizen became an enemy because for, for, for many people who did not go into the details of who left when and where did the people leave, all of them went to Israel and became Israeli citizens and became uh, enemies of the, of the Egyptian state. And I think we can, we can, we can have a, a similar um, um, comparison with Iraq, for example, that the Iraqi Jew 
one decision, one day, one night, and all of them were deprived of their citizenship and were really forced to leave the country. There are only a uh, few who did not. Uh, the Camp David Accord also, or the visit of Sadat, also activated the writings of the uh, Egyptian and Arab Jews who were in Israel, but mainly again here the Egyptians, because it was very much um, an, an Egyptian issue that Sadat uh, uh, w went to Israel. And uh, there are um, famous works of Jacqueline Kahanov and uh, some others. But again, to go back to the discourses, uh, there was um, a publication of the American Jewish Community, Committee, sorry, and the Anglo-Jewish Association of 1950 that quotes, uh, we're talking about the riots of 1949 in Cairo where part of the Jewish quarter was attacked by, by young people of Misr al-Fatah, which is a nationalist uh, movement, and most prob probably of the Muslim Brothers. I mean, it's still until today in discussion and um, archive documents have to be proven in order to, to, to have real evidence who was, who was participating, but at least this is what is known until now. So I quote, in the light of these facts, it's easier to understand the outbreaks of mob violence against Jews in Egypt such as those of 1949, were due in the main less to, in, in the main, less to anti-Semitism than to hatred of all foreigners from the powerful West. So foreigners, uh, and partially also some of the Jews were considered as foreigners, were in fact targeted by these people. And that the, the similar thing happened in 1952. But there was a publication in 1957 called the Black Record of Nasser's uh, Persecution of, of Egyptian Jewry, published by the, um, just a minute, um, the American uh, Jewish Congress. Um, and this publication uh, insists on anti-Semitic attitude of the Egyptian authority towards the Egyptian Jew. And the book of uh, Michael Lasker, one of the famous scholars on Egypt Jews also emphasizes this. So this report, in fact, is the basic for the Zionist discourse that um, argues uh, that the Jews do not belong truly to any, to any of these countries, of these Arab countries they used to, to, live, to live in, for example, Iraq or, or Egypt. And in fact, Jews cannot live in this country after the proclamation of the State of Israel. This is the state of the Jews, and part of the process is that all these people, uh, in fact, migrate to Israel. These two, these two nationalistic discourses sound to be at the very beginning that they are um, contradictory, but they complement each other. It's, it's a complementary relation with them, because the arguments that are argued that Jews are not an organic uh, component of the Egyptian society or Jews are uh, supporters of Zionism, and that's why they are enemy of the state, or the argument that Jews cannot be organic components of, the soci of, of these societies, uh, and after the, the state of Israel has been established as a Jewish state, these people have to migrate to, to, uh, to Israel. Uh, they, they fit each other to, to make like, let's say, like an maybe unwanted alliance of the argument between both. And this, this in fact, is the discourse that uh, dominated. Both discourses uh, lead to a legitimation that it's okay to displace people, and it is okay to, to, like, to deprive people of their uh, nationality, of their countries, for a more important you know, issue or sake, was it the state of Israel or was it the national security? But both, in fact, do not go beyond any political development related to the conflict, both discourses. They, um, they are fixed into political developments. There are no social aspects, no identity aspect, no discussion about economy, and nothing. So to come back to, to, the, to trying to, to, to answer the question that we have in the beginning of the 21st century, um, 21st century, I'm sorry, uh, about why 50 years after all these people left, uh, are, we, are we discussing it or why, why are people interested? Um, having in mind that this discourse, let, let, let's now talk about the Arab countries and not about Israel because it will, you know, uh, explore the, the frame I have uh, 
for, for sure it can be discussed in, in, in other contexts. Let, let's, let's take the Arab nationalistic discourse and the Arab countries. So in fact, um, having in, in mind that this was the discourse that dominated and that was in fact uh, uh, strong and with a very strong hegemony about the discussion about the, with the Jewish question. And now we have novels, we have films, we have activities that go beyond it. I argue that literature and culture are this intellectual spaces and films that one can, especially in the Arab world, one can discuss difficult topics or maybe also taboos. And part of this process is going through literature and not through the official universities or not through, um, let's say, uh, the official role of, uh, role of the state to try to discuss uh, a rethinking of narratives or a rethinking of history is because novels are the place, the space where this, uh, this uh, uh, can find place. And films, as I mentioned. So films and novels were, were the beginnings, music in Morocco, and now in Egypt we, or, or in Iraq we have, we have some, some other activities. So, okay, we have an intellectual space, People discuss these topics, they cannot discuss us beyond it. It's difficult to discuss us in, in, at least in printed press. Egypt had a very special case uh, by the end of 2012 and beginning of 2013 where, where there was really a revival of talk shows where Hafez al-Mirazi, a famous TV presenter, um, interviewed Isam al-Aryan who was one of the heads of the Muslim Brothers and Isam al-Aryan in an interview on the 28th of December 2012 invited all Egyptian Jews to come back to, to Egypt. And upon this, there was um, a, an interview with Magda Harun, who was at that time not the head of the Jewish community. Carmen Weinstein was the head, but she was ill. So Magda Harun went publicly on TV and started the first discussion. And after there was maybe uh, with Magda herself, uh, B Giselle Khouri at BBC interviewed her and some, and some other TV stations. And there was a vivid discussion. It was very interesting uh, to observe it for me uh, in Egypt. So, um, okay, this, this is an exceptional case. This didn't happen in Iraq or in Syria or, or in Tunisia. It, it, it's very specific Egyptian. So, okay, we have literature, we have this space. And why? Why is, is there a younger generation inter interested? From my perspective, and this is my argument, and if you disagree with me, we can talk about it later for sure. The, ans the answer lays in the internal Arabic dynamic in the last two decades. So uh, until the, the 90s, the mid 90s and the late 90s, a hegemonic cultural discourse dominated where the state was controlling newspapers, TV stations, theaters, and a very strong censorship for novels and writings. Um, and it also presented very official narratives through to, to many issues. One of them is the Jewish question, the other one may be the wars that were with Israel. There are no archives open to discuss what happened in the, in the, in the June war or, or also later in the, in, in the war of 73, even, even the, the, the 48 war. So the younger generation um, through literature and through raising the Jewish question is in fact uh, challenging the system. It's part, it's part of the challenge that started to, to, to take place, let's say, starting 2007 to 2008, and one of its peaks was, for example, Midan al Tahrir in Cairo. It's one of the peaks of this movement that the younger generation is challenging official narratives, challenging the system, and challenging also the official, the official uh, uh, journalism and, uh, and TV control. So uh, it's I would say it's like the small steps of an intellectual revolution that started to find place. Now, why the Jews and not other issues? Okay, here we, we, we come back, I mean, besides this, uh, let's say, rethinking and challenging uh, activities of, of, of younger people. Uh, and I mean, novels is one, but when, when, when we really see um, TV works, documentary films, uh, other activities and activities on the street. This is accumulation 
or it's like a big puzzle where many things come near each other to, uh, that, that, that cause the movement, what we know of the 18 days of, uh, of the, to, uh, the revolution of the 25th of January uh, in Cairo and before uh, in Tunisia. So despite of the fact that maybe the main reason of these movements was, was also economics, but not only, you know, it's, it's a challenge. I, I take uh, Egypt as an example again, it was also a challenge to the whole system uh, of, of 30 years of Mubarak. But we shouldn't forget that there is also a factor of nostalgia. I mean, we cannot ignore it, but maybe we should not give it a very huge, uh, how to say, um, um, weight. But still, there is the presence of the absentees. If you walk through any Arabic capital, let's take Beirut, let's take Damascus, Cairo, Baghdad, Casablanca, Fez, Tunis, Algiers, Alexandria, and look very carefully. Everywhere one will find closed synagogues or closed clubs that are about to be ruins. So uh, the, maybe not the soul of these people, but the buildings and the activities these people used to have in these countries are still there. And the younger generation, especially through social media, they now see much more images and films and discussions about, for example, a cosmopolitan Alexandria or a cosmopolitan Beirut that they do, they do not recognize again today. So nostalgia is, uh, is one of the main factors that there is a generation trying to, you know, to, to rebring history, at least uh, in novels. And another, another reason is especially among authors, is that the, the question of minorities is becoming more important or more popular also in international literature. If you go to the European literature, we see also that uh, novels and fiction discuss questions of minorities that they did not do before, and that Ali al-Makri and Ali Badr reach the, the, the Booker's list to be very rational now is also a motivation for younger authors to to, to write about these topics because they know they find interest or they find good selling and they might reach rich prices. Uh, despite of the fact that I don't have really a, a proof, a connection, maybe I will find it. I nearly know it exists, but, but I couldn't find it. That the discussion that found, uh, that found place in Israel and then in America through Ella, Ella Shohat or Yuda Shenhav uh, or Sami Shalom Shatrit uh, and others uh, who, who wrote about uh, the, the rise of the, of the Oriental Jews in Israel, the so-called Mizrahi Jews, might have influenced uh, some of these people, uh, at least to, to, to understand and to know that there is also uh, a critical relation to Zionism and Oriental Jews and, and that there are people around that, that do not you know, um, agree with the, with the official Israeli narrative. I mean, this is, this is uh, uh, not proven, but at least um, it's, um, it's, it's one of the, of the aspects. So, um, challenging of system and rethinking of narratives, rethinking of discourses, rethinking of official discourses um, through the history of Jews found place in a maybe, maybe very slow, but it's part of the process, nostalgia, and the interest to, to reach uh, international audience or wider Arab, Arab audience through the Booker Prize or the, or the documentary films. So this is, this is um, the, the space in which this found place. A major shift took place in uh, Ramadan 2015, and I think it's one of the, how to say, marking points in this process where the Egyptian satellite station CBC broadcasted a TV, a TV drama called Hart uh, Yehud, the Jewish neighborhood or the Jewish quarter. Okay, it was a TV series of uh, 30 episodes. Maybe some of you who are fluent in Arabic also saw part of it. And it, it, it was really, it became very famous. It, the broadcasting was not only in Egypt, it was all over the countries. The, the number of um, audiences who, who saw it was very, very high. And the reaction of media was also very particular. Over 70 media outlets 
in Arabic, French, uh, German, English, and Hebrew uh, reported about this uh, through articles or through online articles or through short TV reports and so on. And they were, uh, these two persons, Minna Shalabi, uh, became like, she is a star and she became much more famous, famous than before. Uh, to put it in, this in context, uh, for those who don't know, um, having a, a so-called Musalsal, a TV series in Ramadan, is the highest season of this TV series. And there is a competition. I mean, there are like five or six parallel running uh, the Egyptian market. The, the Egyptian productions are very important. The Syrian productions were for a while very important. So what I wanted to say is that through having a series during Ramadan means that it's the prime time to reach audiences after, after the iftar. Um, <clears throat> this TV drama is, uh, is, very, is very interesting. I mean, TV dramas as such are also interesting in the, in the Arab context. But here especially, I would like to, to quote uh, Leila abul in her work, uh, Dramas uh, of Nationhood, where uh, she argues that, uh, that uh, the politics of television in Egypt, which also influences the, the other countries and mass media, have in, uh, a huge power or uh, um, enormous power to influence the societies through all its classes. And it's not like theater or opera or a music concern, but TV is much more important. And in, in this case, it becomes more important because, again, it's not only limited to Egypt, but it goes uh, beyond it where, where um, other millions of uh, audience watched it. Um, I would go further than Abu Lughod uh, and discuss um, and introduce, uh, in fact, introduce the perspective of uh, Max Hockenham and Theodor Adorno uh, with their term uh, culture industry or cultural industry that is, again, re related to the term they use, uh, Muslim culture or uh, mass culture. And both terms are the pillars of their work, uh, dialectic of enlightenment. In this context, according to Hockenheim and Adorno, cultural industry is when culture and art becomes a functional instrument, becomes a technology to create a mass culture that aims to shape the awareness of people. So what do we have here? We have a, a TV series called The Jewish Quarter and shows us what at least the makers think it is the Jewish Quarter. Um, wide, fancy flats, francophone uh, um, society uh, that reflects, in fact, the life of the middle and upper class, not only the Jewish, but the Egyptian middle and upper class in the 40s uh, who lived in Garden City and in Zamalek, uh, but less than of that of the Jewish Quarter of the, of the 40s. And uh, besides the main figure, Minna Shalabi and her family, her father is a small uh, merchant. Uh, all other Jews are uh, rich people, businessmen, uh, and most of them are affiliated with Zionism. She is not. Um, and um, there is a figure in the, in the series, uh, the, the owner of the coffee shop is from the Muslim Brothers, and he's the reason of all trouble in the neighborhood with his Jewish and non-Jewish non neighbors. So, uh, Again, if you have questions later, we can elaborate on this, but I, what, what, what I would like to point out here is that, uh, in fact, the, the topic or the question of the Arab Jew, Jews had been brought into, into the public sphere, which is much more and stronger than novels or even than documentary films. But again, it failed to be critical or to, be, uh, to see it from a more, uh, um, diverse perspective, let's say, because um, the series, again, brings us back to the official narrative. It brings us back that the majority of these people were Zionists who collaborated with, with Zionism, either publicly or not. And they give an image that the Jewish community was only a rich community in Egypt, which is not true. Um, more than 50% of Egyptian Jews were, in fact, uh, not, maybe not very poor people, but poor people who lived in very modest and uh, tiny houses and uh, tiny allies. And um, the, the series does not discuss 
the activity, the political activity of Egypt Jews, mainly the leftist, the leftist, the leftist, leftist ones who were in the Hadetto movement, for example, and in other movements. And this is the main critique of Magda Harun when she was interviewed about the series, saying on one side, it was impossible 10 years ago to have this TV series in Egypt or in public TV to talk about this, this topic, but still the series failed. Uh, to transfer uh, an, an image that goes, uh, it goes a little bit beyond the, the official discourse, but not, not in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a big step. Um, and this was the same, uh, it, it's, it's the same uh, similar comment that uh, Professor Joel Bainin uh, of Stanford University, who wrote one of the very important books on Egypt Jews. Again, he welcomes the series and uh, mentions very clearly that it failed to be, to be more diverse and more critical and to see also the other side of the Jewish community um, in Egypt. Okay, I, I'm, I'm approaching now the end of my talk and um, this is an image of the most probably the last bat mitzvah in the synagogue of Alexandria in 1956. Uh, because after that, the number of the Jews in the city uh, diminished and were so, so little that no, no religious events uh, took place. Having all this mentioned, uh, the argument is that having the national discourse, was it Israeli or Arab or Egyptian, as a main discourse for decades, um, I see that there is now an emergence, a movement, uh, a change, maybe winds of, winds of change, uh, to have a post-nationalistic discourse in this regards. So we are moving from a nationalistic context to, po to a post-nationalistic one. Um, and this movement is related to the popular movements that found place in the, in the Arabic streets in the, in the last, uh, I mean, since 2011. And I mean, it's a still ongoing process, maybe less than before, but, but we see that the process is more or less going on. And this post-nationalistic discourse doesn't necessarily ignore the Palestine question or ignore the relation between the Jews and, uh, and the Israel-Palestine conflict, the Jews of Arab countries and the Israel-Palestine conflict. But it finds spaces to go beyond it and not to be hijacked by it for the, for the whole process. And it's also very important to have an awareness of this history in, in these countries, uh, even if it's not, still not uh, on, on very official level, still not in the universities. There are some academi academians working on this question um, like uh, Omar Baum, who's uh, at the UCLA in, in, in Los Angeles, and, and some other younger scholars who are, who are doing this work. But still there is, uh, at least I did, not, I did not find any uh, course or any lecture or any seminar discussing the history of Arab Jews at any uh, Arab university, was it Cairo or uh, the Jordanian University or maybe the University of, of Baghdad. Still we are not so far. So, so the whole discussion is, is, is finding on a, on a different level. So this uh, post-nationalistic discourse um, tries or it, it finds spaces to go beyond the conflict and to discuss these questions beyond the conflict. Again, uh, it's important because also in Israel there is now a, a different discussion than it was before about the, 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 the Jews of Arab countries. And there is also um, a political movement, in fact, asking to, to find space for compensation for these people who, le who left these countries. And uh, it's, it's important to have also balance on the, on the, on the other side of the equation that the, 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 the Arab, the Egyptian, the Moroccan, the Palestinian, and all the historians to be aware of what, of what um, history uh, they had. And I think it's also important because it, it creates an awareness, an awareness of how, how should and how is the future for young people to deal with the uh, rigid uh, discourses and how to shake them uh, and to find, uh, to find um, um, spaces to discuss even and to agree and disagree uh, on discourses. So um, I think we are in the, in the beginning, maybe also in the middle, but we cannot see it because we are still in it, in the middle of a, of, of a post-nationalistic discourse, considering the question 
uh, of the of the Arab Jews and the, and the question of the history of these communities in these countries. Um, thank you very much, and uh, of course, um, any questions later. Thank you. Thank you.